BioBalance HealthCast, episode 187, Personalized Medicine versus Guideline-Based Medicine. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today, Kathy and I are going to be talking about an article that Kathy found in a a recent edition of JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, that dealt with personalized medicine versus guideline-based medicine. And as is often the case when I read what she's asked me to read so that we can talk about it, I didn't really understand it. (laughs) So, because I was thinking, uh, especially with the the whole discussion about guideline-based medicine, the concept, as I did understand it, was that the medical association... Uh, produces these guidelines for how you should treat certain manifestations, certain symptoms, certain illnesses. And it's almost as a checklist. And I said, oh, the Google. You know, and, yeah. and we don't really need doctors anymore. We just Google something, <laughs> and then we see what we have. Oh, my gosh, I'll die. And we send to Mexico and China <laughs> for medicines, and we treat ourselves, and we can just... Oh, my rem- gosh. That is just so extreme. Well, really? Do you do is, that? But there are <laughs> Tell people, me you don't do that. Uh, well, I thought about it until you started explaining why that was a real problem. <laughs> Especially the, the episode we did about importing drugs from China where there are little worms and stuff yeah. in them that grow yeah, in your intestines. Great, yeah, that, that part that, that was great was, weight loss. You get worms. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's walk through why okay. this is a relevant conversation and okay. what it means. Because you were explaining that, that there are sort of different kinds of doctors out there in terms of their mindset and the way they approach the practice of medicine. There's a book called How Do Doctors Think? Uh And actually, the book's written by a doctor who is not a guideline, meaning rote memory. Go down the list, make sure in your mind that everything's been done, Mm -hmm. and then send the patient out with that prescription that there's or the lab test they're supposed to have. So, That's so, so one these are the kind, kind of doctors, doctors that don't do off-label medicines. Right. They're the doctors that follow the guidelines given to them by the American College of Cardiology, the American College of of uh, OBGYN, the American College of, of whatever specialty it is. Mm-hmm. They follow those guidelines rote. And, and the reason they got into med school so easily is because they were really good at memory and really good at lists and really good at going down the line. And, and, and I think Doctors are chosen a little differently nowadays, but well, like but I in said, my the, era, the Google, right? Go to med school. Except, except that the doctor still has to look at the patient and fit oh. those guidelines to that patient, and realize when there's going to be something that conflicts with one of his other medicines, right. one of his other diseases, one, one or one of her other or her age group. Mm-hmm. So all of that is not really good for Google medicine. I mean, that's not what doctors really do. Right. They're sitting in the room with you and they're absorbing what you're telling them, what what they know on their list and what your age is and what you do for a living and how, you know, what your family situation is, your psychological makeup. So they are absorbing all that and then going by the guidelines and picking and choosing what you need. Okay? So I had, I had a friend a couple years ago that died from he died from a heart attack, but he had cancer. And we got all these emails saying the cancer treatment killed the cancer. And a week later, the guy died of a heart attack. Uh, and they, and <clears throat> the belief is that the cancer treatments caused him to have the heart attack. Uh, because and that, they weren't, wa- it was a different specialty, watching a different thing, and it right. fell through the cracks. But it's one of the risks. When you treat cancer, you're killing a lot of other parts of your body. Yeah. You're killing your immune system. You're killing a lot of other things that keep you safe. Right. And they can actually cause damage to other tissues. Which is in the fine as, print of the document you sign at the hospital. Right. And that's take- part of decision making and part of what the doctor should be telling each mm-hmm. patient, obviously, or writing it. You know, when you walk out with something the doctor gives you, you should not throw it in the trash. You should actually read it because what he's done or she's done is said, I don't have three hours to talk to you for, about this. So an hour and a half is on that sheet of paper. So I want you to read that and assimilate it with what we just discussed. So it's better that you read it sooner rather than later. Okay. And help make the decision for yourself instead of just going, okay, do whatever. I mean, that's not a good answer. But but so so guideline medicine is guidelines plus a doctor plus a patient, not plus guidelines. Plus my portable memory. 
I'll yes. take my wife with me. Yes, to yes, uh, of course. And you should. And in general, that's a good idea. Not somebody who's going to interfere with the interaction yes. with the doctor because there's well, some. Help me remember what they said. Some family members were always breaking and going, "Oh, you know, I got this sacroiliac thing." That's not what you want. You don't want that family <laughs> yeah. member. You want the family member who's actually going to come in and take notes while you guys are talking and uh, write her own little ideas or his own little ideas there, and then help you remember everything right. because I, I think the percentage of what you can remember. Remember, in a visit with a doctor is 15% of what was said. Wow. So it's better to have Study two show. sets of ears. Yeah. So so in that way, that's that's very important. So so those are the doctors that are very um, contained and they don't they don't like change all that much. They really want to linear. follow they this. They go through the checklist. Right. But when they get to a point where, like in a surgery, they've never seen it before, God forbid. Surgeons are usually more creative than than the rote memory, but or if they've never seen something before and they don't fit into the guidelines and they just go, oh, you need a tri- you need a psychiatrist because that, they don't know what else to do, or you know, I don't know what to do, so I don't know where you should go. See ya. You know, they should be saying it's in this system. I'm not sure what's wrong. So I'm going to send you to this doctor who's a specialist in that system. Or they should not be saying, oh, you're just crazy. See ya. That's a really bad answer yeah. because that really distracts the patient from what's really wrong with them. And it, it actually just makes the doctor feel better about themselves, I guess, unless you really do have signs of psychiatric illness. But the other type of doctor that we're talking about are doctors that personalize medicine for the patient. So they know all those guidelines, but they're much more intuitive and deductive about what they do when you're in the room. They ask key questions. They get key answers from you. And if they get the, uh, an answer that doesn't fit, then they pursue that. Then they actually, in their mind, they're putting together a treatment plan, a diagnosis and treatment plan that is just is for you. Yes, it may have some of the guidelines in it, but no, they're not restricted by that. So if I see somebody who has, who comes in and there, there was a, I had one patient. I don't often get this because we screen our patients so much. But I had a patient who had been a patient before for hormones, and came in last week, and she came in and she was 100 pounds heavier than she had been the last time she saw me. Mm -hmm. She was 350. Oh, wow. And not very tall. Right. And as she walked in the room, (gasps) she was having trouble breathing, and she sat down, and her legs were swollen, and her face was swollen, and she she was all red in the face, and even at rest, she had trouble breathing, Mm -hmm. and her, her, her joints were collapsing from the weight, okay? 50 something years old and and she said I think my hormones are off <laughs> and she couldn't breathe and right. I went through all my questions for the hormones and yes of course her hormones were, were off, off right but she had every symptom of heart failure mm-hmm. okay so I'm not a cardiologist and I'm not going to make that final diagnosis but I know a lot about a lot of different diseases right I mean, that's what doctors are, we're supposed to know a lot about everything, but then treat a narrow uh, right. type of, of uh, illness, uh, just kind of a list of illnesses. And then if we don't get into those lists, then we go to a different specialist. So it took me 45 minutes to convince her this wasn't hormones. Mm-hmm. It was much more serious, and it was something she should take seriously. Right. And she should seek out a cardiologist just so that we didn't have to go through the internal medicine step to then go to the cardiologist. I was trying to save her time. Mm -hmm. So I referred her to a cardiologist, and she was very disappointed because I didn't treat her with hormones. But she'll be an entirely different person when she, when her heart when is managed, right. and when she loses her hundred pounds again, and when she or more, and when she's she's taken care of, she's on the verge of diabetes and other things. That cardiologist will then you know treat the most important part, right. and then go the to triage the triage it, to the thing that could get you, we always triage to the very top of your list, what what can kill you in the next couple minutes, days, yeah. you know, and that always should be treated first, not last, so right. I didn't want to wait, have her waste time going to me, then right. back to her internist, then back to her, because 
I was afraid she wouldn't make it out of my office. Right. And I, I tried to impress upon her how important this was. But she thought she was tired because of her hormones. Because in the past, 10 years ago, she was tired because of her hormones. Right. But she stopped doing hormones and gained 100 pounds. And then, so so I had no way of knowing ahead of time. This is, this is what's called personalized medicine. I personalized not what, I, I didn't go, oh, to, to, um, to somebody who has a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I didn't do that. You don't just go, oh, hormones, hormones, hormones. You go, oh, we have, we have hormones. Yes, we've got a hormonal deficit, but we have everything else that's much more acute right now. And you go to that. Other things in personalized medicine have to do with looking at the person as an overall human being first, not looking at your list first, mm-hmm. but looking at the person. Right. And then saying, what's the first symptom? What's the second symptom? What's the third sy- symptom? What's the tenth sy- symptom? And do all, these all go together? Mm-hmm. Or are they separate but equally important things that we need to treat? So, so the personalized medicine doctor utilizes both inductive and deductive reasoning right. and, and thinking when trying to solve the problem that, that presents in the patient's life. And that's more efficient. I mean, it may take longer in the doctor's office, but that's more efficient because you're not going to 10 doctors for 10 symptoms. You're going to one doctor who's saying if he can handle it or she can handle it, you have all of these symptoms and five of them fit into an arrhythmia, heart heart arrhythmia, and five of them fit into hormones and five of them fit, I mean, female and male hormones or female hormones or male hormones, and then you know, three of those symptoms are thyroid. I'll treat that because I know how to do that. I'll treat the right. female hormones. And then we're going to start you on treatment for your prediabetes. But if that doesn't work, we're going to go to somebody else to get more specialized care. All of that is personalized. And that's just a regular doctor visit. To get right. more personalized, we go to genetics. I do your genetics. I find out uh, what whether you can take us any kind of cholesterol-lowering drug. If you have the genetics that says you can't, I can't lower your cholesterol that way because you'll get sick. You have to do it a different way. I have to do it a different way. So that's very specialized. Instead of giving everybody cholesterol medicine, we have to go and and see if that's your issue. Instead of giving everybody testosterone, I have to look at their labs first to see if they need it and then see if there's another disease that's causing their fatigue and their anxiety. Like if you have the gene for breast cancer. Right. Or if you don't. Right. So, and then it's also the patient's choice. It's not just you have to do this. See right. ya, bye. I'm out of here as the doctor. It's like so. You have the gene for breast cancer. Well, and then, so and, then Angelina Jolie, right, proactively, voluntarily made a radical choice that most women don't make and might not make. Right. But she made that choice because genetically she was at risk. Right, and she and she had witnessed. Right. Her family member. Right. I think, which is, I think, her mother, and I think, and the, and she, that she was so emotionally tied in to experiencing the disease with someone else right. that she was fearful every day, and sure. fear causes anxiety, and anxiety causes other it increases diseases. Increases the chances of things. So, going wrong. if I were her doctor, and she had come to me with that kind of anxiety and and fear of getting this problem, this disease that could kill her or disfigure her, I would have said. Okay, this that to me that made a reasonable, that was a reasonable answer yeah. for her. Right. That's not a reasonable answer for everybody. Which is the personalized medicine right. approach. Right. Because for her, that kind of fear, right. which she may not, if she's an actress, she doesn't show fear, but that kind of fear that would cause you to, to almost have a phobia sure. to just get this, get it out of my system. Right. I mean, I kind of understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I do understand her situation. But not everybody should be doing that. So it's an, when you see stuff in the paper, it's not everybody should do this. And I don't think everybody should take testosterone. I was at a party last night with people who were all over fifty-five, and many of them did not take testosterone, and many of them looked well and were healthy, and honestly, they had taken such good care of themselves, Mm -hmm. and they had such good genes that half of them I I would not have probably had to treat. If I did their testosterone level, they didn't have symptoms, and their levels were probably great. The other half, I could have helped. So So, 
so let's talk a little bit more though about the personalized medicine versus guideline based medicine. You've talked specific examples of guideline criteria that are set up by the American College of and all these different mm-hmm. medical specialties. There is a whole branch of evolving medical treatments uh, called anti-aging medicine. Mm-hmm. And they don't have the same colleges and the same established entrenched guidelines. Sure, so because it's a new like hormone replacement. Is about ten years they're about ten years old. Uh-huh. And they have two groups of doctors, one AMMG and one A4M, who are kind of vying for control. Each of them have not guidelines, but they they standards. Standards. Standard of, of care. How they think you should that manage a patient, mm-hmm. but they don't tell you exactly how to manage them because right. they realize the treatment's not the same for everybody. Well, and it's a new ballgame. Right. I mean, the, the approach, the conceptualization, the interventions are a new process that you have to evaluate. And it might make more sense to the listeners if we took a specific example and walked through the process that a personalized medicine doctor would make within the frame of standard of care concerns mm-hmm. as opposed to rigid, pre-established, agreed-upon guidelines. And standard... Let, let me... State standard of care is a legal term. Okay. Not but doctors use it. All right. Standard of care means what is the least, the lowest level of treatment that is that constitutes uh, adequate medicine. Okay? The lowest. A- adequate is a legal term. Adequate is a legal term. In other words, yes. if you have a doctor and a bad outcome, mm-hmm. then the first thing that the the, the expert physician does is they look at the records and they go they 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 they, they're looking for what did that doctor think what did that doctor do what did they do when was that fast enough was that did they think enough about this did they make their decision how often did they give you morphine how much did they give right when in the process did they decide to use it so so there it there are guidelines that are put out there by our um Colleges, the American College of OBGYN in my case, that state you should do these things or some of them or one of them, but those are the, those are guidelines. Standard of care in general is what is the lowest level of care that you can give and not commit malpractice? And honestly, most doctors don't know that. Right. I'm married to a lawyer. So I get the benefit of having both a small bit of legal knowledge and the rest I leave to him. But he teaches me this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the lowest level of care is what standard of care is. It's not the highest. It's not the medium. It's the lowest. So when somebody says, well, I've provided standard of care, I'm like, so? That's not great medicine. That's just... That's the le- least amount. And, and they look at that also, what's the lowest level for a city? What's the lowest level for, for rural? Because that's different. Well, the same thing exists in my business. In, in counseling, we are taught, for instance, in dealing with suicidal patients that have suicidal ideation or give indications that they might be suicidal, that it's not our responsibility to save their life. It's our responsibility not to be negligent. So there are certain minimal things that we should do, like get a safety contract and document that we've gotten one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all and documentation. If, if we can document that we made this intervention or that intervention or called these people or did, did things mm-hmm. that were expected to be done, and then the person still manages to kill themselves, then it's at least we're not legally at fault. And and that's actually a very valuable positioning because mm-hmm. you can't control what somebody is going to do. That's true. You can offer support and advice. Well, it just keeps and, you from getting sued for trying to, I mean, you're trying to do your job. Right. And you shouldn't be sued for trying to do your job because someone does something that's completely out of character for some reason. Something happened in between visits and they they didn't call you and they just... Well, un- unless you're swimming in the wrong pond. I mean, if you right. don't know anything about the management of suicidal clients, right. if you haven't had any training or any exposure, and then you get in the deep end of the pool, and, you shouldn't be there. Right. And you then know, that's, that's when negligence. you make referrals. Exactly. Yeah, and that's negligence if you don't make a referral. Right. But, um, I mean, I we go through this all the time. When I was an OB, I mean, I'm still an OB, but I mean, I'm a retired OB. But when we did um, upset obstetrics, there was a rule from the American College of OBGYN and from the legal community that said that if a baby is in distress, the doctor has 20 minutes to get the baby out. 
Right. Now, that in St. Louis, thank you, God, we have a system of having doctors, usually board certified OBGYNs, but sometimes resident OBGYNs mm-hmm. in every hospital that delivers a baby. So if I am 20 minutes away, right. then I can say, take her to the operating room, get started, right. get the baby out, and I'll be there, right. but I'm 20 minutes away. Right. That doesn't mean the baby's going to be okay in 20 minutes, because 20 minutes of, of not being able to breathe is too long. Right. It means the baby's not going to be lost in that 20 minutes. Right. That, that the it, intervention they, can begin. They, that just doesn't mean they're not going to be lost either. It just right. means from the time you diagnose uh, fetal that distress to the time you get baby out, they figured 20 minutes was a reasonable time right. to give a doctor to get to a hospital who didn't have somebody who could do a section right. and get the baby out. Or at least, I mean, sometimes it's delivering the baby from below, but whatever, it's usually a C-section if right. they're in distress because they're usually right. not ready to come out. So having said that, is 20 minutes a safe interval between fetal distress and getting a baby out? Well, if it's my baby, yeah, no. No. If it's my baby, let's go and, faster. And if I'm the doctor, and I'm standing there, and there's, and there's fetal distress, and either I'm the doctor or I'm the mother, I'm like, nope, we got this baby out right now. Five minutes, right. we're in there. We're that baby's out. The cords clamped. The baby's off the mother's system, right? Because then we can, the baby will breathe air, right. and we want it to do it as fast as possible. Right. So I'd be talking to the nurses. I'm like, move, move, move right now, and they're like, we have 20 minutes. <laughs> You know, they they bought not, not in my operating. They room, bought and yeah. swallowed the twenty minute rule. Right. And to me, if I'm standing there right by my patient, and she's looking at me to take care of her, like I would take care of me or my daughter or my or anybody right. in my practice, I'm like, no, we don't mess around. We are just going to do so this. So, for our conversation purposes, that is the guideline. That represents the standard of care. The lowest level of care you can give to not get sued, but. <laughs> That's yeah. what everyone should think of when a doctor says, oh, that's a standard of care. I'm like, yeah. what does that mean? Who, who's that helping? And sometimes standard of care change. So it's not something that, like, is a hard... I used to think medical medical rules were hard and fast. But now that I've been doing this for being in medicine for 30 years, I see that they change all the time. Right. So it's something you have to keep up with. Right. So... Which is why you have to get CMEs. Continuing yeah, you have to get CMEs. Yeah. And you have to make sure you go to your conferences to learn... I guess what the standard is, but also learn what the best medical practice right. is. And what's changing, what's evolving and why. And but then that's not enough. You also have to use your best judgment. Even if a, a guideline says, like they said, oh, there is no such thing as PMS. I know there's such you know, in the nineties there's no PMS. Right. I know there's PMS. Right. I mean, I know it. I see it. I treat it with progesterone. It gets better. So so Right. I know that the guidelines aren't always right, and sometimes we're ahead of the guidelines, and that's what we're doing with So, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about that specifically with regard to replacing testosterone and the side effect issue that occasionally happens with hair loss uh, as a continuation of this discussion about personalized medicine versus guideline-based medicine. So if you're interested in learning about hair loss and the issues around how doctors make those decisions and make interventions following guidelines versus personalized medicine approaches, come back for our next podcast. Thank you for listening today. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.